It's 2017. It's a new year, a new beginning. 2016 is done. So, since it's a new beginning, I've decided to start this podcast. You know, it's it's funny. I actually planned on starting this podcast last year, last January. That was one of my 2016 plans. Well, as we all know how 2016 pretty much turned out, it uh, it didn't really pan out how I wanted it to. And, you know, I can make many excuses for for why I didn't start it. You know, I started a new job. But the reason is I just, um, I was really too lazy to do it. I kind of went down in, in a little bit of a slump with my YouTube channel as well for a few months, but that's all over with. It's done. Everything's back on track. So, welcome to the first inaugural Shea in Japan podcast. If you're a longtime viewer of my YouTube channel, thanks for tuning in to the first episode. Welcome back. Hope you guys enjoy this, this style, this format. And if you're a new listener, welcome. Please enjoy this podcast and check out my, my YouTube channel and my website, shayinjapan.com, youtube.com slash user slash Shay Roberts. But let's get down to it. This is the beginning of a new year, 2017. Speaking of beginnings, I find it, I guess it's uh, appropriate if I tell you my beginnings of how I got to Japan. So, you know, really what I, first off, what I really want to do with this podcast, and I don't really want it to focus on me too much, even though it's called Shay in Japan. It's really going to be about my experiences in Japan, as well as other people's experiences in Japan. So what I hope to actually do with this podcast is interview different people living in Japan, not just other English teachers, but people from all walks of life, other countries, and find out their motivations for coming here, why they came to Japan, and what they do in Japan. But, just to get it all out of the way, let's use this first episode to focus on how I got started in Japan, when I came here, and why did I come here. So, if we look all the way back, turn your your mind's clock back, tick-tock, 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 all the way back to when I was a little kid, I like to watch Cartoon Network when I was young. It was, uh, I remember actually when Cartoon Network first came out. You know, at the time, all they played were shows like The Flintstones, Scooby-Doo, and, you know, kind of retro old school cartoons, which I thought was really cool at the time. But then, a couple months or a couple years into the uh, opening of the, the channel, they played three Japanese animation movies, uh, anime movies. I had never really seen any animation like that before. The, uh, the, I forgot one of the movies, but two, two of them that debuted on there were Akira and Vampire Hunter D, which I continue to like to this day. And it's really weird because even though I like those movies, I'm not really a fan of Japanese anime. Like, I, I don't see anything wrong with it, honestly. I just, I just don't really watch a lot of it. I'm just not really into watching Japanese anime. But Akira and Vampire Hunter D just blew me away. I had never seen anything like that on American television before. And they, they didn't show it during the day when most of the kids are watching. They only showed it at nighttime after midnight. And so I remember being up one late one summer, I think, or on a weekend, and I caught a little bit of Vampire Hunter D, and I was just fascinated by the style, how it looked, and just the mature nature of the film. And Cartoon Network had advertised it as coming from Japan, from from the East, you know, so... This was back in the early 90s, 
you know, this was, the internet was around, but it was like really pre-internet. So for a kid, eight or nine years old, viewing something from Japan, which I'd only heard about before, I thought, wow, that's, that's so cool, you know? I, I thought that was really cool, that it was so, such a, a different and, and foreign thing. And I guess my knowledge of Japan before that was limited to, you know, the, the stereotypical Japanese cultural stuff that you normally hear about, um, sumo, sushi, ninjas, whatnot. I was really a big fan of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles cartoon as well. I thought that was a really good uh, Saturday morning cartoon to watch but that it that introduced me to the the concept of ninjas and that sort of thing and then of course the the ninja turtles movies as bad as they were uh came out and the third one actually went to medieval japan i forgot what era it was maybe edo period they went there and so you know watching that cartoon watching those movies and seeing the first Japanese animation in Akira and and Vampire Hunter D that I saw, my that sparked my initial interest in Japan. And I don't know, I can't give you the exact date or the exact time when I said it, but I made a promise to myself that I was going to live and work in Japan one day. It was just, it was always in the back of my mind. You know, as the years went on, I, I never really paid much attention to it. Fast forward to when I was in university. I was just about to graduate, and I was wondering what I was going to do for a job. You know, I considered maybe becoming a teacher or a professor, and I thought, well, I always wanted to travel abroad. And a professor of mine told me about opportunities to travel to China or to Chile or to Spain teaching English. I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. I never heard about something like that before. And then I thought, why why China? Why why Spain? Why Chile? Th those are all good and all. I actually really considered going to one of those countries. But then I thought, you know, I've always wanted to go to Japan. It's just something that was still in my mind. So I took his advice and my my desire to want to go to Japan and I did my research. I just went to Google one day and I typed in teaching in Japan. And this was back in 2007 when I first had this idea and I started Googling. And, you know, a bunch of links came up. I can't even begin to tell you where I started to look, but the one website that grabbed my attention the most was the the school of Eon. Many if if you're not really familiar with English teaching in Japan, Eon is one of the big at the time the big four English conversation company schools. So they're they're for profit businesses. And I was really unaware of, of what Nova was. Nova at the time was making headlines for being one of the, the biggest English conversation school out of Japan, and it went bankrupt. Uh, they, they had a lot of shady practices and a lot of bad press because of that. And so I, I never really learned about them until much later, but, but Eon caught my attention, and I decided to do a little bit more research before, you know, applying and all. And I, I found some blogs and some and read some things about what people were saying about teaching at Eon. And most of it was, was pretty positive. And I think my desire to go to Japan was far outweighing any sort of negative things that I read about working at Eon. Don't get me wrong. I'm not here to badmouth Eon or Eikawa teaching at all because actually it was probably one of the most positive experiences for me was working at Eon but it was definitely not something that I wanted to do forever. I made the decision. I said why not apply. They were going to have recruiting in Dallas 
which is the closest big city to where I grew up, a two-day interview. So I submitted my application, my resume, background, all that stuff, and they emailed me back and said, hey, come on over We're to the first day interview. It was a group interview. And so I put on a tie, suit and tie. I drive two hours to, to Dallas to a hotel, and I have a group interview with Eon. Before I get into what the actual interview was, I, I did research what the Eon interview entailed. And it was the first day is basically a group interview. And if you pass their sort of screening process that day, you come back for a second day interview and it's more of a one-on-one -on -one interview. Well, I had a little bit of preparation about the Eon interview before I went in. So I was mentally a little bit prepared. But basically what they ask you to do is they give you a topic and you have to be a teacher and use the other interviewees as your students and kind of lead an impromptu lesson. Knowing me and my background, I actually was deathly afraid of, of getting in front of people and speaking. And you may be wondering, if you're deathly afraid of speaking in front of people, why the hell would you want to be a teacher and stand up in front of people. For me, it was really getting over that initial fear of getting in front of people and, and speaking that motivated me to do it. I, I was just, I didn't want to have that fear in me anymore. And I think the best way to overcome your fears is to face them head on. So it was, it was really nerve wracking when I did it, but you know, I got the call back at the end of the interview process. They said, yeah, come back tomorrow. Oh, sorry. One thing I forgot to mention was before that impromptu lesson is they just give you a whole uh, spiel about what Eon is and, you know, their corporate culture and what they believe and just general information. But the, the meat of the, of the vetting process is your impromptu lesson that you have to give. Now, day number two is pretty much kind of the same, but it's just one-on-one. -on -one. So I went back and I I went to the, the hotel room that they had rented out for interviews for, and, and I met with one of the, actually the Japanese recruiter. And she asked me general interview questions. Why do you want to come to Japan? What do you like about Japan? Things like that. And then I had to do two impromptu lessons based off one of their books. One was aimed at adults and one was aimed at kids. And th this was actually kind of weird, I thought at the time, was she's an adult, but she's acting like one of the students. So she speaks English fairly well, but then she pretends to be a, a student that doesn't speak English very well. Well, fair enough. That's cool. But then she actually started acting like a three-year-old kid, and I thought that was, it was a bit odd, but, you know, I actually, I think it's it's pretty cool, uh, like, she gets into the role play like that. I guess it, it kind of helps the, the the interviewee feel more in place of what they're, what they'll be facing in an actual classroom setting. Well, needless to say, I got the job. I got the, they called me back, I, th I think it was either the next day or a couple days later, and said that I got the job, and just to wait and stand by on an opportunity to come up, like a placement to come up. They had asked me where I wanted to go and live in Japan, and I, you know, I don't know the exact reason why, but I thought Kobe, Kobe, Japan would be a nice place to go. When the recruiter called me back, he said, well, we can't get you Kobe, but based on your criteria of wanting like a medium-sized city, kind of, you know, close to a big city, near nature, things like that, they said, how about Utsunomiya? Well, I'd never heard of Utsunomiya before in my life, ever. But he said it was, you know, maybe an hour from Tokyo by train close to nature, close to Nico, jazz is really famous in Utsunomiya, and to be honest, I just wanted to get to Japan 
So even though Utsunomiya sounded nice, I just, I said yes, regardless. You know, I would have said yes, regardless, just because I, I wanted to move to Japan. And so I got the job. The whole process took, I, I, I believe I did the interview in 2007, but it wasn't until August of 2008 that I actually moved to Japan. Fast forward to when I first came to Japan, this was my first time I'd ever really been to an East Asian country. It wasn't the first time I'd been to a foreign country, though. I'd been to Mexico a few times, and that was nice. But this was the first time I'd actually been to an East Asian country. It was the first time I'd been going there with the intent of staying for a long time. A country that was such a vast difference than where I came from in small town in Texas. So... The moment that I land at the airport, I wait for one of the trainers to, to pick me up and everything, and I meet some of the other people who I'd be training with. And, you know, they're all from all, all over the world. And we get on a train and we, we head to Omiya. Omiya, Japan is where I trained for the first week. The moment I stepped out of Omiya station and just looked at how a Japanese city was, I was... I was it was breathtaking for me. Now, I mean, it's 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 normal. Like, nothing, it's not really surprising at all. It's just regular old Japanese city for me. But at the time, I was, uh, I was awestruck. One thing that stuck out in my mind about the training process is, you know, everyone chips in and cleans themselves. Like, there's no custodial workers that are hired to clean. Everyone chips in. And... I later find out that's part of the culture in Japan, uh, corporate culture and school culture. You know, everyone chips in and, and cleans and helps out. And there, you very rarely do you see custodial staff. Yeah, I mean, they exist here, but it's it's a rare thing to see at places when to see uh, custodial staff. So I thought that was really interesting. The actual training process was, you know, going through how to teach a lesson and they brought in some students and gave them free lessons, you know, and used us as the teachers, you know, uh, to kind of be, they were like guinea pigs for us to teach. For me, yeah, man, still talking in front of people was, was nerve wracking. So before every demo lesson that I had to give, I was just a bag of nerves. But, you know, after, after two weeks of, after one week of training and then after two weeks of actual teaching, that just all went away. I mean, I, there's still things that I work on all the time, but the initial fear of getting in front of people was, was gone. Yeah, that is, that's basically my beginnings of, of how I got to Japan and why I decided to come to Japan. And looking back on it now, because I've been here over eight years now, and it's been a great, great experience. I've been through many different jobs since then. My time at Eon was very short, actually. I only worked at Eon for about a year and three months. I think I'll save my time at Eon for a different episode. Business-wise, Eon does very well. They don't mistreat their employees as far as foreign staff. I've never heard of bad things about the foreign staff, at least from my experience. I'm sure such a big corporation, you know, there's there's bound to be disgruntled employees at, at some point. In terms of how they treated me, it was fine. They were actually very accommodating, and they helped me out a lot getting my apartment and my phone, my, cell, my first cell phone in Japan. They really helped me out a lot, and they're still in business. They didn't go the way of Nova or Geos or many of these other places that are no longer around. Eon is still around. I don't regret ever working with Eon. In fact, I'm I'm happy that I chose them as my first stepping stone, my first foot in the door to Japan. It's really a great place to transition into Japan. Yeah, my time at Eon was short, but I met a, a lot of amazing people that I'm still friends with today. I still communicate with today, and they helped me out a lot with getting around Japan, and in figuring out my life here. That's it. That's my beginning story. 
it's definitely not the end. Thank you guys very much for listening to this first episode. If you enjoyed this podcast, just send me an email, S-H-E-A-R-O-B-E-R-T-S at gmail.com. That's SheaRoberts at gmail.com. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast if you like it, as well as the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash user slash SheaRoberts. Lots of cool videos on there. And I'll see you guys for the next episode. Episode.